So far in these lectures, we have covered the longer-term causes of conflict in the 17th century and the importance of religion and the failure by any ruler to solve these issues. Instead, only their inability to bring a level of toleration to religion in Britain. Last lecture, it ended with the trial and execution of the king, leaving the rump parliament in control. This image is from a contemporary Dutch engraving showing Cromwell dissolving the rump. Cromwell says, Be gone, you rogues. You have sat long enough. On the wall, the words, This house to let, are written. This event, in 1653, will continue the journey of Britain into uncharted realms of government. In this lecture, we will review the attempts to reach a constitutional settlement by 1660 and why each attempt failed. In doing so, we will, knowledge-wise, be able to contextualise the narrative of the Commonwealth and Protectorate. Skills-wise, Analyse the reasons why Cromwell attempts to take control of the situation, so that you can then, behaviourally, evaluate the reasons behind the attempt's failures. Instantly for those who executed Charles I, they faced issues with establishing a government to replace him. Ireland was a royalist stronghold with a Catholic army who was ready to fight for the king, and Scotland proclaimed Charles II King of Scotland, even though he was in exile in Holland and was not crowned until 1651. Due to the political uncertainty, power passed to the remaining MPs in the Rump Parliament, which continued to shrink in size when the Lords did not return. As a result, the Rump declared itself the sole authority, and a council of state was elected. In March 1649, the House of Lords and monarchy were abolished, and England was declared to be a Commonwealth, governed by a single chamber parliament. The fundamental issue for the regime was it was the work of a minority who needed wider support. Its first task was stability. However, the main fear of the people was the army, which the regime needed to survive. A paradox therefore develops. The government needed the army to make the people feel safe. However, the use of the army by the government made the people feel in danger. This need can be seen by the role the army played in. Firstly, the suppressing of the threats from the level of mutiny at Burford in May 1649, where the ringleaders were shot. Countering the threats from royalists in Ireland, Cromwell landed in Ireland in 1649 and stormed the strongholds of Drahiga and Wexford, slaughtering thousands of defenders and civilians after they had surrendered. In 1650, Cromwell returned at the head of the army to attack Scotland, defeating the Scots first at Dunbar in 1650, and when Charles II led an attack in 1651, defeating them at the Battle of Worcester in September, where the young Charles hid in an oak tree. From 1652 to 1654, England was also at war with the Dutch in the First Anglo-Dutch War over trading rights. To raise money for warships, a monthly assessment was used, raising as much as Charles's entire annual revenue and modelled on ship money. However, unlike ship money, this tax was authorised by Parliament. While the army defended the regime, the Council of State turned its attention to reform, especially reform of the law and an increased social justice, believing this will increase popular support of the regime. The greater gentry and nobility refused to cooperate with the regime, questioning its basic legitimacy to rule. As a result, the lesser gentry had taken over much of the local government in roles that were traditionally filled by the greater gentry. Nevertheless, two factors prevented the rump from providing the sought-after stability post the execution of the king in 1649. Firstly, these reforms involved complex areas, such as the law, and these could not be agreed upon. The Howe Commission was set up in 1651 to investigate the reform of the legal system. Its recommendations were never adopted. The rate of reform also slowed over time seen in the number of Acts of Parliament passed between 1649 and 1653. In 1649, 125 Acts were passed. However, by 1652, this should reduce to just 51, causing concern as to what the rump was actually doing. Secondly, the necessity of maintaining a large standing army was the cause of such high taxation. The paradox that now existed was to plague the rump. Without support from the political nation, the army was required, 
but as long as the army existed, support from the political nation was not forthcoming. To raise funds, the rump from April 1649 began to sell Crown lands to raise money. However, the wars in Ireland, Scotland and against the Dutch led to a shortfall in revenue of £700,000 in 1653. Many of the threats on their own were of minor irritation. However, when combined, they could create the failure of the new regime and the return to monarchy. Ultimately, a mix of repressive measures and apparent vested interest by Parliament drove Cromwell to dissolve the rump by force in 1653. This will herald in Cromwell's attempt at stability and reform. Between 1651 and 1653, Cromwell had attempted to balance the demands of the army while attempting to persuade the rump to enact reform. The straw that broke Cromwell's patience was the rump's decision to hold new elections to replace those who had been excluded or stayed away. When he learnt that Parliament was going to rush through a bill for elections, while ignoring the reforms desired by the army, he ordered the dissolution. Cromwell's solutions to ruling Britain covered two clear aims for him. Firstly, a godly reformation of the nation, and secondly, ruled by a Parliament. Most times, these two aims were incompatible, causing the collapse of each attempt. Cromwell's first solution was the nominated assembly. The nominated assembly consisted of 140 selected members by Cromwell and the churches. It was supposed to act as if answering the call of God and enact a godly reformation. In a speech at the opening of the nominated assembly, Cromwell said to its members, Truly you are called by God, and you are called to be faithful with the saints who had been instrumental to your call. Therefore I beseech you, but I think I need not. Have a care of the whole flock, love the sheep, love the lambs, love all, tend all, cherish and countenance all, and all things that are good. And if the poorest Christian, the most mistaken Christian, shall desire to live peaceably and quietly under you, I say, for any shall desire but to lead a life of godliness and honesty, let him be protected. What this shows is Cromwell's attempt to meet his two aims, godly reformation and rule by Parliament. The nominated assembly has many nicknames. Barebones, after one of its radical members, praise God, Nicholas Barbon, or the Parliament of Saints. Nevertheless, in its short life, it continued the war with the Dutch to secure trade routes, introduced measures to help debtors and the treatment of lunatics, and civil marriage could be performed by the justices of the peace. However, the radical elements within the assembly, such as the fifth monarchist, a radical religious group, pushed the moderate members to request its dissolution by Cromwell in December 1653. Three days later, John Lambert had written the instrument of government, based on the heads of proposals given to the king. The instrument of government saw a Lord Protector, Cromwell. When dead, a new protector was to be elected from the Council of State. Parliament was to also support the Lord Protector, as a single chamber of 460 members elected every three years by voters with a property qualification of £200. Each parliament must sit for a minimum of five months. The army was to remain under Cromwell's command, a state church where freedom of worship was granted for all except Catholics and supporters of bishops. This government was to govern England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. The first protectorate parliament was a reasonable success, passing 84 laws, including improvements to the postal service, maintenance of the roads, as well as banning bear baiting and cockfighting. It also passed laws to prohibit blasphemy and drunkenness, meeting Cromwell's two aims. However, for Cromwell, he faced resentment from the members of Parliament, who had not forgotten his dissolution of the rump. He attempted to force the members to take an oath of allegiance to the Lord Protector, which most refused to do. In January 1655, Cromwell dissolved the first protectorate parliament. In the spring of 1655, a royalist uprising led by John Penn Ruddock in Wiltshire convinced Cromwell he needed a stronger control over the provinces. The country was split into 11 districts, ruled over by major generals, who were to be responsible for the local government and security of their districts, aided by new militia groups. 
This was to be paid for by a decimation tax, 10% on royalist estates. Mixed reviews of the effectiveness of the major generals. Some were more godly than others. Wally suppressed the plays in horse racing, while Worsley closed down 200 owl houses. Others neglected their duties. Meanwhile, Cromwell, by the commissions of triers and ejectors, had brought a degree of organisation to the church with emphasis on quality and flexibility of belief. However, the major generals were unpopular due to their military nature and Cromwell understood the need for an elected body. A newly elected second protectorate parliament attempted to limit the power of the protector by offering Cromwell the crown. Under the humble petition and device, they suggested government by a king, changed the Lord Protector due to opposition of Cromwell as king from the army who had supported Cromwell. The Lords and Commons to govern the Protector, provision for a hereditary succession, Parliament to control the army and officers of state to be provided by Parliament with regular elections and limited religious tolerations. Whether or not the humble petition could have created a constitutional monarchy is a matter of debate. In September 1658, Cromwell died, and January 1659 saw the brief third protectorate parliament under Richard Cromwell, Oliver's son. A brief conflict between the armies of General Monk and Lambert saw Monk march into London, replace the third protectorate parliament with the remaining members of the rump and long parliaments, and secure the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. Britain's experiment in republicanism was over. In this lecture, we have reviewed the attempts to reach a constitutional settlement by 1660 and why each attempt failed. In doing so, we have, knowledge-wise, contextualised the narrative of the Commonwealth and Protectorate, and you need to complete the associated material to consolidate this. Skills-wise, analyse the reasons why Cromwell's attempts to take control of the situation failed, so that you can now, behaviourally, evaluate the reasons behind the attempt's failures please complete the associated material to ensure you meet these aims.